Oh, wait, I'm just kidding. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. I forgot what day it was. Our reading is from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and all the meditations on our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grief is a powerful emotion. It affects us physically, emotionally, and spiritually in ways that we don't even realize. Every year in the summer, as the um, air starts to turn warm and humid, my body starts to react. I begin an awful bout of insomnia. My body just refuses to sleep. I become tired and achy and hungry. I will eat anything in sight, even if it's a vegetable. And I'm overwhelmingly sad without knowing why. Until suddenly one day, I look at the calendar and realize that it's nearing August 25th, which is the anniversary of the death of one of my best friends. And then I know why my body has been acting so weird. It's been almost 15 years, so you'd think that I would know year to year why my body is doing this, but somehow my brain is able to forget year after year until the rest of my body reminds me. Grief, just like its sister emotion, depression, is many things. It is a great equalizer. All of us will feel it at various stages in our lives. It's also the great unequalizer because we all deal with it and feel it differently. But grief is also, like depression, a liar. Because grief tells us things that are not true, things that we begin to believe. It tells us that we will always feel this emotion this intensely, that we will never feel better, even for a moment. It tells us that we are the only ones who feel this way. Grief convinces us that we are alone and that this is the end. But our gospel reading this morning tells us that none of those things are true. The story of Easter is the story of hope, which names all of those lines that grief feeds us as lies. We can see the lies of grief in the actions of the disciples after Christ's death. They do what we all do when we are grieving. They gather together. They hide away. They eat. They cry. They begin to tell stories of their loved ones, remembering things that they said. 
They probably spent time thinking over conversations they'd had recently with Jesus, remembering things they'd said that they shouldn't have or maybe things that they didn't say that they wish they had said. They probably went over their regrets, including Peter, because that's what grief makes us do. They probably analyzed what they could have done to save him, what different choices they could have made that would have changed the outcome of that first Good Friday. And then they ate, and then they cried some more, because that's what we do. Only this time, the story began to change a little. First, it begins with Mary, who goes to the tomb early in the morning to help prepare Jesus' body, a ritual that they couldn't complete until the Sabbath was over. And when she gets there, she sees that something has happened. The stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. Jesus' body is not where it should have been. It's not where they left it. So she goes back to the disciples. Maybe she needed reinforcements. Maybe she needed someone else to see what she saw so that she wouldn't feel so crazy because grief can convince us some pretty crazy things. Or maybe she just didn't want to be alone as she tried to figure out what happened. Or maybe her grief-stricken brain just would not compute what she was seeing in that tomb. For whatever the reason, she goes and tells the disciples what she's seen, and two of them return back with her, Peter and what John calls the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loves. As they get to the tomb, the beloved disciple outruns Peter, maybe a burst of energy brought on from adrenaline, and he peers in the tomb, it tells us, but he doesn't go all the way in. Once Peter gets there, in typical Peter fashion, he barges right in and sees that Jesus is not there and that the clothes are not where they should have been. The beloved disciple finally musters up enough courage and he joins Peter in the empty tomb, observing the grave clothes lying there. And it says, the beloved disciple saw and believed. But John's gospel doesn't give us any idea what Peter was thinking what he made of the empty tomb and the neatly folded grave clothes. It does tell us that they both returned home, and there's no indication in the passage or in any of the other Gospels that they went to share that news with anyone else. Mary, though, John's Gospel tells us, stayed there at the tomb. It seems like she did not quite connect what she saw with what Jesus had told them before his death. So she stays there, praying, kneeling at the empty tomb. And she doesn't get the truth until Jesus comes and calls her by name. And then she knows. She knows that the lines grief had been feeding her, that she's alone, that this is the end, that death has won and evil is triumphant, are just that, lies. Because the truth has come and rolled away the stone and left it empty. What I think is fascinating about John's account of the resurrection is that he goes into so much detail about the disciples' actions and reactions. He could have summarized, made it simpler and shorter, but he doesn't. Instead, John includes all of the disciples' reactions and by doing so, invites us into the story. David Losey says it this way, John leaves room for each of us, for one who sees and believes, another who sees and leaves uncertain, and one who needs to hear her own name. John's account doesn't just stop there. He goes on to tell us about how the resurrected Jesus visits the disciples in a locked room, and when Thomas, who was missing for the first reunion, doesn't believe the others, Jesus comes back to meet with him, even offering for Thomas to touch his hands and his side. The Gospel of Luke reminds us that the disciples, consumed by their grief, didn't recognize Jesus walking with them to Emmaus until they gathered around the table and broke bread together. You see, I think sometimes we are so fixated on trying to decipher and decode every encounter of the resurrected Jesus that we overlook what a gift each of these accounts is. In their grief, they all responded the same way, with confusion. Not one of them sauntered up to the empty tomb and said, Aha! 
I knew it. It's just as he said it would be. He's been raised from the dead. None of them expected the resurrection. And when they were finally confronted with it, they all responded differently. Some saw and believed almost immediately. Some left undecided. Some had to hear their names. Some had to see his wounds. Some had to share a meal with them. And so Jesus shows up again and again and again, speaking truth in the way that each of us needs to hear it. Friends, the good news of Easter is not just that death does not have the final say. The good news of Easter is that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and that the truth will set you free. The good news of Easter is that Jesus speaks truth and life into our lives, and when we don't hear it the first time, when the lies of grief have plugged our ears, when our hearts are still strangled by the burial clothes, Jesus comes to us again and again and again without condemnation or criticism. When we go away uncertain, filled with doubts and questions, when we need to hear our name, when we need to touch and see, The tomb remains empty for all of that. Jesus simply shows up, matter-of-factly speaks our name and the truth of who we are into our lives. He extends his arms and embraces even our doubts. That's the good news of Easter, that Jesus' truth is stronger than the lies the world tells us, even stronger than the lies that we tell ourselves. My best friend, every night before her kids go to bed, tells them four things. Number one, mom and dad love you very much. Number two, you are beautiful. Number three, you are good enough. Number four, you don't have to settle. I asked her once why they say those four things every night, and this is what she said. We tell them these things every night because life can be hard. The world can be a callous place where lies The lies we are taught batter and bruise our hearts. Sometimes kids at school tell us we aren't good enough to play with them. Companies hire really talented advertisers to convince convince us that you aren't pretty enough or thin enough or young enough. Sometimes we believe the lie that that bad grade means we aren't smart enough, that we'll never be good enough. Sometimes when we mess up, when we give in to temptation, when we hurt someone we love, when we break our commitments, we think we aren't lovable, that we aren't worthy of love. Sometimes when we try something and fail, we think we have to settle for less. Every day, we're told lies. And if there are no other voices speaking truth in our lives, we begin to believe the lies. So we tell our children four truths every day. Friends, we all need to hear the truth spoken to us over and over and over again. It's not enough to simply know it. It's not enough to hear it just once. We need to hear it over and over again so that all of those lies that the world tells us don't take root in our hearts and our minds. And that's what the empty tomb proclaims this morning. God loves you more than you could imagine. God loves you so much that God is willing to go through immense suffering in order to draw you back into relationship with him. That's what Jesus calling your name in the garden is reminding you. You are beautiful. You are an incredible, one-of-a-kind masterpiece handcrafted by God. There has never been anyone like you, nor will there ever be again. That's what Jesus extending his pierced hands to you is saying. You are good enough. No matter how many times you doubt or question, no matter how many times you don't live up to your own expectations, no matter how many times you give in to temptation, you are good enough. There is nothing that you could ever do that would put you beyond the bounds of God's grace. Because surely, if God can conquer death, God can redeem you. That's what God wants us to know as we gather this morning around the table, breaking bread and seeing as if for the first time. You don't have to settle. You don't have to settle for who you are now. You don't have to be paralyzed by hopelessness, overwhelmed by sorrow and grief. You don't have to settle for less than who God made you to be. You don't have to settle for living life as if it ends with the tomb. You can live in resurrection freedom even now. Friends, whatever lies are holding you captive this day, may the truth of Christ 
set you free, because Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.